Hello and welcome to the first coffee shop astrophysics talk for the fall 2020 semester. We're very excited to be back presenting this interesting science for our audience after a short break when the world all shut down in March. At this point, for this semester, we're planning on having two talks, the one today, obviously, and we'll have a second talk in November on the 21st. So there'll be a little bit more of that in a minute. So you might notice that things are a little bit different, <laughs> unlike our normal talks in a coffee shop. You may be sitting in your living room in your pajamas like we've all been doing the last several months, and that's just fine. So we decided to move to virtual talks so that we could still give our audience their science fix. So make sure to keep an eye on our social media for information about the talks as they come up. We will keep you up to date with everything that we're doing. We'll have some more of these talks next semester. Since we are posting these talks to YouTube, um, at least for this presentation, we will not be able to do the live Q&A session that usually follows our talk. So we ask that if you have any questions about the talk, please post those in the comments for this video or email it to the Coffee Shop Astronomy email address, which you can find both on our YouTube page as well as on our website. The last thing I'll note is that this, this presentation style is not necessarily the same presentation style that we'll have for our future virtual talks as we sort of work out the kinks and the best way to present this information. We'll be sure to let you know of any changes that will affect your viewing. So we usually start our talks uh, with a brief description of who exactly Coffee Shop Astrophysics is. So we are a, a group of graduate students and postdoctoral researchers all our students at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Most of our members come from the Center for Gravitation, Cosmology, and Astrophysics, or CGCA, though we generally, once a semester or so, will have guest speakers from outside of astronomy to give talks on interesting science. And as always, we're interested in hearing what you guys want to hear us talk about. We have lots of ideas for coffee shop talks, but in order to deliver the most interesting content for you, we ask that you please send us any ideas that you might have for coffee shop talks that you think would be interesting, and we'll try to fit those into our schedule. So today's talk, which is a slight digression from astronomy, focusing on something a little bit more topical, is what makes viruses go viral? So this will be a description of viruses, how they work, what risks they might pose to organisms like us, and what techniques we use to mitigate those risks. Our talk will be delivered by Smrithika Subramani and Rayson Souza, two postdoctoral researchers at UWM in the biophysics group of the physics department. We're very excited to have them to give this talk because they're both very knowledgeable and great speakers. So with that, we can head on to the talk. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a postdoc here at UWM uh, in the physics department. And uh, the lab I work in is called the Laboratory for Advanced Biopolymers and Nanomechanics of Proteins. Uh, in our lab, we basically try to understand how proteins unfold uh, under different forces. And why this is important is because um, for example, when you consider how you bend your hand, the flexing of your muscles, these are all intrinsically proteins that are continuously folding and refolding uh, under forces. And when uh, a protein misfolds in some, uh, due to some uh, reason, you can develop uh, various uh, degenerative diseases like cataracts and Alzheimer's. And in our lab, we basically try to study this from a more microscopic perspective and uh, try to understand what, what exactly is happening at the nanoscale level. Now, I'm an experimental physicist, I'm not a virologist, but uh, since we're kind of curious about uh, the current pandemic that's going on, uh, we termed it uh, essential to be talking about uh, viruses and uh, how exactly they cause infections and what are the ways in which we can combat these sort of uh, disasters that happen around us. Um, so why should I care about pathogens? 
uh, you may know that nearly one third of all the human deaths on planet Earth are in fact caused due to infectious diseases. Now you have uh, various ancient diseases like tuberculosis and malaria that are uh, constantly uh, booming around us. But uh, there are also new pathogens or new disease causing microorganisms that keep developing uh, or emerging around us all the time. And unfortunately, this burden of diseases isn't spread equally across the planet because you have uh, certain countries that have poor public health systems and uh, their, uh, th the cure for these sort of pathogens is often compromised by certain natural disasters as well as political upheavals. Um, on the other hand, uh, since the mid 1800s, a lot of scientists and physicians have always been struggling to identify uh, the causes of these pathogens. But more recently, we can conclusively say that there have been uh, really many, many advances in uh, trying to combat these diseases because of uh, all the advances that we have in molecular biology and cellular genetics. And because of this, we can understand the various causes and mechanisms of such diseases. Um, so the, the human body, in fact, is, if you can say, a complex ecosystem, because we have nearly 100, uh, 10 trillion cells, but we also have 100 trillion microbes that are living within us. Now, microbes constitute various types of bacteria, protozoans, and viruses. So we also have thousands of species within these microbes. Uh, however, not all of them are dangerous at the same time. We have a certain normal flora, wherein you have bacteria that are uh, depositing on your skin, mouth, as well as the large intestine. And in fact, some of them can be quite useful because anaerobic uh, uh, digestion from bacteria can actually uh, help us um, maintain our gastrointestinal pH in some sense. And then you also uh, have certain pathogens that are actually harmful because they are slightly different from the normal flora. They're able to live in locations where the normal flora can't. And the question that arises is, in, in such a world where we are surrounded by pathogens, how do uh, subtle and uh, very slowly evolving humans, how do we survive? So our body has developed certain physical barriers such as skin and various acids in the stomach that can combat these sort of germs. Uh, but we also have intrinsic capabilities. And what I mean is that at the cellular level, at the single microscopic level, we have developed certain specialized proteins that can act together to fight against these diseases. And that's what is called innate immunity. But whenever you're also the innate immunity basically acts even whenever there is no pathogen around you. But when an infection kicks in, your adaptive immunity is what becomes active. And that's more specialized and a bit more complex. And it also is uh, focused uh, specifically for the pathogen that is attacking your body. Now, like I said, pathogens are often looked at in hostile terms. We think of them as invaders that are always attacking us. But if you think from the point of view of a pathogen, they're also just trying to live their life. They're basically trying to invade your body, live in it, you know, free of cost. And uh, they don't really have a particular strategy. They just do what they're supposed to do. Uh, unfortunately, the human body is a very... Uh, optimized environment for these pathogens because it's nutrient rich, it's warm, moist, it has a constant temperature, and it's constantly renewing itself. But uh, the pathogen has a certain mechanism that it follows, wherein it tries to colonize the host. It tries to find a perfect region to stay within the body, and then it tries to avoid or circumvent the immune responses that the host is already developing. And then it tries to replicate, it has to make its own progeny. And once it multiplies to a large extent, it needs to spread to the next host. So coming to a specific pathogen that we'll be talking about today, namely viruses. Viruses can basically be viewed as tiny hijackers. Unfortunately, viruses live in everything. We, we are regularly eating and breathing millions of virus particles. 
but like i said they aren't all going to cause an infection they are also constantly evolving they are replicating so fast that with every cycle that they have they are actually also being mutated and this sort of mutation sometimes spreads along with every generation of humans that we have that they indefinitely become a part of our genetic makeup and that's why we can look at them as molecular fossils because we can sort of trace back uh, the genetic makeup of our ancestors uh, from the the viruses that are now a part of our genome uh, and more importantly their genetic material uh, that the viruses have is in fact uh, surrounded by a protein coat and a membrane so it's very well protected the question that arises is whether we should look at viruses as dead or alive and this is often a conflicting situation because a lot of uh, media uh, news tries to anthropomorphize them but we shouldn't be doing that because viruses are not dead neither are they alive they are just active or inactive they don't have their own agenda they just have one function which is to infect the cells to reproduce within them and uh, to basically become a parasite uh, in the protein machinery that the host is already offering the virus so uh, when a virus is on a surface on any table it's not really living at that point it's only when it enters the perfect environment which in this case is your skin or the cells within your body that's when it becomes alive uh, or active so when did viruses first come into existence uh, it is said that they've actually been existing since the very beginning of life uh, so in a sense we have been coexisting since several centuries uh, and uh, some of these viruses can actually be beneficial to our ecosystem so one such example is uh, some of the uh the, the lakes that you have at for instance the yellowstone national park uh now these the temperatures here are roughly 122 degree fahrenheit and you have certain tropical grasses that need to build a kind of thermal tolerance to survive in this heat uh it's interesting because they adapt themselves because they have a fungi that infects them now this fungi is in turn affected uh, by a virus and it's a sort of symbiotic association because the fungi is helping the plant and the virus is helping the fungi survive so it's uh, it's it's a sort of three way system that actually helps the plant uh, to to survive this kind of heat and then every other year we have the tulips that are blooming um, in netherlands and you have millions of people going there uh, one of the striking tulips over there which is the striped one is in fact the result of a, a viral infection that kind of invades the pigmentation of tulips and gives them this sort of appearance um so since several centuries we have been co-evolving with them as i mentioned they are sort of molecular fossils and one such virus is the polyoma virus which used to be lethal many years ago but now it's it actually lives within us and we are sort of breathing and excreting it all the time even amongst our family members but interestingly this virus uh, which was used as a fossil could trace back our ancestors uh, who migrated from africa to various other continents and there were actually two strains of this virus which is quite interesting to see the uh, the diversity in uh, its replication and uh the question that next arises is how big are viruses or rather how small are they so we also have to note that viruses must actually assemble using preformed uh, components and uh, they come in various shapes and sizes so you have uh, the largest ever virus that was uh, that has been discovered so far is the the pandora virus it's roughly a micron in diameter and what i mean by a micron is the human hair if you divide it 10 times then you would have a single pandora virus and then you have uh, other smaller viruses like the flu virus which is just a few hundreds of nanometer which is like 1 billionth of a meter uh, these viruses are let's say much smaller than even a bacterium which is usually in the micrometer scale so 
because I was talking about bacteria, we also need to know what's the difference between a bacteria and a virus and what is the difference in the way they replicate and how it affects the, the kind of diseases that they can cause in humans. Uh, so bacteria are actually living, uh, unlike viruses. So they are unicellular, which means they have a single cell in them and they have their own sort of machinery, like a house. So they multiply using their own resources. And this process in which it multiplies is called binary fission, where you have a simple single cell, which is the parent cell, uh, and the, the sort of genetic material that it has inside is constantly floating around in this cell. Uh, and when uh, it wants to divide, this genetic material gets split and it results in two uh, single individual cells, which are called the daughter cells. Now, these daughter cells later on mature again. They have their own genetic material floating around and then they keep, it, it constantly keeps multiplying in this way. So whenever you're infected with a bacteria, uh, you would most likely be prescribed an antibiotic. But on the other hand, viruses are not really cells. They are acellular in that sense. And their genetic material, uh, in contrast to bacteria, is very nicely enclosed in a coat of protein. And they multiply only when they are inside another cell. So they are uh, those uninvited guests that just make use of the host cells resources and they generate their own copies which can further spread to, to other cells. So as you can guess, a bacterium being a living cell can also be infected with a virus and these sort of viruses are called bacteriophages. So uh, there is a whole branch of science called viro virology which deals with uh, the mechanisms in which viral infections occur uh, and people here try to understand the structure and the assembly and disassembly of these continuously evolving entities. Uh, but uh, the nature of science is such that we all take help from each other. So we have uh, research that encompasses cell biology, where uh, the biologists attempt to understand um, the exact uh, mechanisms in which these viruses work. Then you have physicists and mathematicians who are constantly developing models to understand the dynamics of infectious diseases. And then you have the epidemiologists who also study the emergence and evolution of such infections. And this sort of uh, unifying and simplifying generalization uh, is much better. It makes much more sense rather than studying one isolated situation. So let's go back a bit and look at how we first started seeing viruses. So uh, Anton von Leeuwenhoek was the first guy who actually discovered or invented a microscope. Now this microscope back in the 1600s was very primitive. He just used to grind a bunch of uh, glass lenses and try to look at um, cork cells in wood, for example. Uh, so right now we have super fast, amazing light microscopes that work with complex optics and help us look at structures that are on the micron scale. But more so recently, we have made so many advances with electron microscopy, where you use a powerful electron beam. And you can actually get uh, structures that are resolved to the nanometer scale. And uh, this small picture here I show is from May this year, where uh, scientists were able to see single coronavirus particles within a cell. So here is just an image of an infected cell where you can see this sort of ring-like structure that makes the coronavirus uh, uh, coronavirus. And um, later on, we had Louis Pasteur in the 1800s who is, let's say, a really great scientist because he contributed in so many ways to understanding microorganisms, apart from, uh, of course, showing us that bacteria can make amazing things like cheese and wine. He later on also went uh, to discover uh, a vaccine for babies. And uh, we must also give credit to Robert Koch and his germ theory because he was firstly uh, able to experimentally show that injected microorganisms in animals like mice uh, can actually cause diseases because back in the day no one really knew what germs were and what what were the reasons these you know people were dying with 
various other diseases. Um, so it was the early 1900s that viruses first came to be identified. They were not really called viruses at the time. Uh, we had, uh, for instance, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, yellow fever and rabies and polio, and then bacteriophages slowly became uh, a thing in 1915. And then, of course, influenza virus was discovered in around 1933. Uh, but what intrigued scientists at that time was that unlike bacteria that could be filtered out in solutions, the viral particles used to pass right through. I mean, they didn't know what particles they were, but they noticed that, you know, that, that there was still this sort of uh, virus that, uh, uh, and a sort of entity that was uh, infecting people. And uh, they first noticed this in uh, the leaves of tobacco plants, and this sort of gives a patchy appearance and that's why it's called the tobacco mosaic virus. Interestingly, the tobacco mosaic virus is the first uh, virus to be called by the name. And um, uh, later on, of course, it became so common that now we have uh, in the early 1940s, the Zika virus, Ebola, uh, HIV virus that cause AIDS and now SARS-CoV-2. So we had scientists in the 1950s like Thomas Weller and Frederick Robbins, uh, whom we have to give credit for because they showed that polio viruses, which were um, studied at the time to a large extent, they could grow them in non-nervous tissue. So they, they uh, actually cultured viruses on human embryonic skin and muscle tissues. And this was a sort of landmark finding because we reduced the reliance on using live monkeys for growing and testing the virus. And uh, so polio research was then not really restricted to just facilities that could you know, have a large number of animals. And so the concept of cell cultures in a lab actually came in. And this was a uh, very, interesting because it could finally lead to simpler and less expensive methods to produce these large quantities of viruses that we needed to study because this could eventually help with vaccine production. Um, and further, I want to uh, make this point clear is that all infections are not productive. And why I say this is because when a virus infects a cell, it doesn't infect all your cells at the same time. The cell needs to be a certain way for it to actually infect you. So you have almost four different types of host cells. You have a susceptible cell, which has a functional receptor for a given virus. So the cell may, may or may not be able to support viral application. Then you have a resistant cell, which has absolutely no receptor. So it May be it may be competent to support viral replication. And then you have a permissive cell which has the capacity to replicate a virus, but it may or may not be susceptible. And the perfect cell is actually both susceptible as well as permissive. And this is the kind of cell that makes a, a viral infection infectious. So here is a very nice video of uh, viral particles actually infecting a, a plate of cells. So what researchers commonly use um, in the lab is called a plaque as assay. So where the, they basically take a stock of viruses in a solution and then they keep diluting them. Uh, and then they further put these uh, droplets onto a, a plate on which you have a single layer of cells. Then they observe the growth of viral particles over time. And as you can see in this video, you have the cells in the center that are dying, and then the viral particles are continuously spreading outwards. And this term is called viral plaque. And interestingly, by counting the number of viral plaques that you have, you can examine the sort of infectivity or quantitatively uh, measure the number of viral infections that can occur. Now, most viruses have a sort of one-hit kinetics where one viral particle is actually enough to cause infection to several cells. Um, coronavirus, for instance, falls in the one-hit category. There are also several other plant viruses that follow two-hit kinetics where uh, just you, you need actually need two viral particles to 
suddenly cause an infection. We need to understand how viruses actually replicate. And typically, we try to understand this in terms of a bacteriophage, which is the virus that attacks bacterial cells. Now, the bacteriophage has a kind of a simple structure, and that's why it's easy to understand. So their genetic material is usually in this sort of prism-shaped head, which is surrounded by a protein capsid. And this is uh, usually connected to a sheath, which is sometimes called the tail. And beneath the sheath, you have spikes that actually penetrate into the cell. Um, so viruses replicate using two methods. Now, there are some viruses which make use of this lytic cycle that I've illustrated here. So you have a bacteriophage that basically attaches onto a cell and slowly tries to inject its viral genome into the cell. In this case, I'm just uh, saying bacteria. Um, and when the viral uh, genome starts dominating the cell, it begins to degrade the genome of the host. And once it degrades the, the host cell, it's sort of, it, it's caught unaware. And that's why it starts replicating the viral genome, thinking that it's part of its own makeup already. Uh, so once the virus has tricked the, the host cell into making its own sort of particles, it assembles all of them because it needs to form a structure and it finally releases them and, you know, infects the next cell. Uh, now, this can also happen in two ways. There can also be uh, a, a lysogenic cycle where the, the viral genome already enters the cell, but it retains itself there. And only when the, the host cell has already replicated into, you know, two or three more cells, the viral genome becomes active. And that's when you have more number of cells that are infected. So different sort of viruses alternate between the lytic and lysogenic cycle. And uh, in 2018, I found this video really interesting because people were actually, scientists in France were actually able to uh, visualize uh, how the HIV virus transmits in, in, a, in a sort of live mode. And this is a, a very remarkable and beautiful insight into cells that are associated with virus transmission. Uh, in this sort of fluorescence microscopy video that we have here, uh, you have uh, an HIV virus that is labeled with a fluorescent green color. And then it starts shooting out a string of viruses that you can see here on the right. And then finally, the virus is transported uh, to an outer layer of, of another cell, which is labeled with blue. And then it sort of establishes contact with the, with the host cell. And in, in a couple of hours, it starts detaching itself and it starts moving on. And it already has the viral particles within it. So it's, it's really interesting to see how this sort of infection is happening in a, in a live mode over here. So just a week ago, uh, we had the Nobel Prizes that were announced in physiology and medicine. And uh, rightly so, it was uh, to a group of three scientists, Harvey Alter, Michael Hutton, and Charles Rice, uh, for the identification of the novel virus uh, that is responsible for hepatitis C. Now, this virus had actually eluded scientists for several decade, decades because uh, hepatitis A and B were cured, but the sort of effects that hepatitis have uh, started prevailing in patients that especially underwent a blood transfusion. And through genetic engineering, um, they were able to inject um, uh, an RNA variant of hepatitis C virus, and they were able to see in chimpanzees that uh, they were they, they 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 displayed symptoms of hepatitis C, and this sort of discovery of the virus is is a landmark achievement uh, against the ongoing battle that uh, patients who have just had blood transfusions uh, face, and. The, the disease can actually now be cured and it raises hopes of eradicating hepatitis C from the entire world population at some point. We, we also come back to understanding the genetics of a virus. Uh, like I said, uh, the genetic material of a virus is 
very safely enclosed within a cap of protein. But in the 1950s, people didn't really know what the protein coat was or what, what exactly was within a virus. And uh, Hershey and Chase actually back in the day when radioactivity was still fun and nobody knew the, the drastic consequences that it could have on the body. Uh, they, they took a bunch of viral particles and they, they, blend, they, they labeled them up with uh, radioactive sulfur and radioactive phosphorus. So they had the, the protein labeled with radioactive sulfur and the, the DNA within it labeled with uh, radioactive phosphorus. And they infected the cells uh, that they wanted uh, to study and then they blended them up and when they finally removed the, the sort of remains that um, that you get after blending, they found that it wasn't the protein coat that contributed to the replication but it was the genetic material that was actually uh, causing viruses to to multiply in this way and at this time this was important because nobody really knew what was Resp what part of the virus was responsible for uh, carrying infections to further to other to other cells? So, as we all know, uh, the biological blueprints that make up our uh, body rely on uh, DNA and RNA. Now, DNA encodes all the genetic information that we have, and it's only a kind of short-term storage. But in the long term, uh, DNA also serves like a flash drive because uh, it allows the blueprint of life to be passed between generations. Now, RNA is complementary to this because it functions as the sort of reader that decodes this flash drive. And this reading process is multi-step and there are various specialized RNAs that, uh, you know, do these steps. And Interestingly, the viral genome is slightly different from us. So in the human body, we have only a double-stranded DNA structure. But in viruses, since the nucleic, acid, uh, nucleic acids alone are the genetic information, uh, they also have uh, variants, namely DNA viruses as well as RNA viruses. So you have some DNA viruses like Fox uh, virus, herpes virus, and then you, you also have RNA viruses like influenza, rabies, HIV, polio, and uh, the, the coronaviruses as well. So what sort of information is actually encoded in the viral genome? What makes it so different from humans? Uh, the viruses mainly have their genetic uh, material in order to synthesize their proteins, which uh, also contributes to replicating their genome. They also have they also express these sort of proteins in order to package their genome in a certain way and also control the timing of their replication cycle. And further, they can try to modulate the host defense uh, by you know, manipulating the, uh, the genetic um, uh, processes within the host cell and further uh, trying to spread to, to the next cell out there. Um, but the viral genome doesn't really contain the complete protein synthesis machinery that humans do. So the function of uh, the structure that viruses have is mainly to protect its genome. It's mainly to coat its genetic material. So most viruses you'll see actually have a sort of envelope or membrane, and that's what makes them different. They have different configurations. Uh, so you can see here that all of these viruses are of different shapes, um, but they also uh, have uh, a metastable structure. And what I mean by metastable is that they can continuously switch between being unstable and stable. So they are mostly stable when they have a symmetrical arrangement of uh, many identical proteins to provide a sort of maximal contact, just like, just like a football structure. And then they're also unstable whenever they try to detach or they're usually not uh, permanently bonded. And so like, like Lego blocks, you can actually take them apart or loosen them up depending on their infection and the release and what exactly they're doing in the host cell at the time. Uh, and this sort of structure nowadays can be resolved using techniques like cryo-electron microscopy, 
uh, where you take uh, snapshots of viral particles and try to reconstruct them in 3D, which is super amazing because now uh, with a recent paper that we had a week ago, you have uh, a resolution of 1.2 angstrom, which is basically the distance between two carbon atoms. And this is like the smallest ever distance that you will be able to see, which actually uh, is going to revolutionize uh, microscopy in some sense, because now you can actually see within a, a single viral particle as well. Now, Watson and Crick were uh, responsible for discovering the structure of DNA along with Rosalind Franklin. Uh, but they also actually studied many viruses and they were able to deduce whether uh, that they were able to actually deduce with uh, viruses which were rod shaped as well as spherical. And even viruses, while building themselves, follow a certain rule of symmetry. They, they basically make sure that each subunit is identical to the next subunit and they are bonded in a certain way. And these bondings are usually non covalent, which means that they can break up and release whenever they want. Um, generally, the symmetry in um, viruses are of two types, a helical symmetry where you have this sort of cylinder-like structure, and then there's an icosahedral symmetry, which is basically a solid with 20 faces, which is built from pentamers and hexamers. And the smallest subunit, which is like a single viral particle, has 60 faces, and this forms a closed shell that actually makes the virus appear spherical. So some of the viral particles with helical symmetry are the tobacco mosaic virus, and most of the viruses with icosahedral symmetry are those of polio, SARS-CoV-2, and then you have a bunch of other viruses that follow neither of these symmetries, which are quite complex, like the Pandora virus. So viral genomes are in fact the fastest evolving entities in biology. Because of their short replication time, and the large quantity of offspring that is released in one reproductive cycle, you can say that they indefinitely affect the genetic makeup of the host cell that they induce. And this genetic makeup is then transmitted to the offsprings. And sometimes uh, two viral particles can infect a cell. And this is in the case of a co-infection where uh, a genetic shift takes place. And of course, viruses can also randomly mutate because when uh, you have an infection, um, it, it might be due to a defective virus, so it might not really cause an infection. Uh, so like I said, because the viral particles are so small, uh, in comparison to bigger animals like humans, uh, their mutation rate is much higher. Uh, so this puts into perspective uh, the fact that viruses are continuously evolving, they're continuously changing. So the next pandemic is probably right out there because you have uh, the sort of continuously changing genetic makeup. And uh, with, with this part, I wanna, uh, wanna conclude by saying that uh, I've looked into viruses from a very physical and um, structural perspective because uh, I like to look at it at the microscopic scale to, to further understand how exactly um, they affect the real world. And in the next part of the talk, you'll be learning a bit more about infections, what causes them, uh, how you know uh, humans are actually developing immunity and what's going in, um, in what's going through uh, the vaccination procedures um, that, that actually could uh, help us combat these sort of diseases that we have uh, due to viruses. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Raison and I am a postdoctoral researcher in the Ormas research group here at UWM in the physics department. Uh, we are specifically looking into biophysical uh, um, the phenomena in nature and our research usually involves biophysical phenomena. For example, we've published uh, uh, recent papers on functional trajectories of uh, important proteins and how they behave. Uh, just by using snapshots. So what our group uh, does is use machine learning techniques to uh, sort of um, extract as much information as possible from uh, images of these proteins from a microscope. But our research is not just um, focused on uh, 
proteins, but we also look at, for example, gestational age in fetuses. And this was an important work from our group, which was published uh, recently. So, so I want to start this talk by saying uh, we live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. What do I mean? What I mean is we're constantly taking in viruses as we breathe and eat and passing them out. Most viruses in nature uh, are usually harmless. For example, you have viruses that inflect plants or animals, and these viruses usually do not get activated in a human body, and you just pass them through. For example, you might have viruses which transfer to you because you, I don't know, rubbed a dog's fur or something, and uh, it ends up on your skin, but then it doesn't get activated on your skin, so you, it just goes away at time. Right, and so with that, I want to say that we 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 coexist, like we've heard in the previous talk, uh, with viruses and um, learning how they infect uh, uh, us is sort of an important and crucial step in understanding um, virology in general. Uh, sometimes enough virus particles can get inside you, harmful virus particles, and you might have a situation where it's replicating inside of you. It infects. It finds cells which are vulnerable and it starts replicating. Often or not, you have situations where the person uh, or the infected host is completely inapparent to the infection, right? Um, and that happens, and if you've heard it in the news a couple of times recently, is this person is asymptomatic to the virus. What does that mean? That means that the person has antibodies which fight off the virus. So in some sense, uh, this person may carry virus particles or uh, on, on them or inside of them, but they're completely unaware of it. Now, let's move on from, from asymptomatic to what happens when you actually get an infection, right? So there are three things that can happen. So you can have signs of an infection. So this is like if you have a runny nose or if you're coughing, right? This is evidence that you have an infection and this can be observed by other people as well. So people know that you have a sign of an infection. This is, of course, much before then, uh, much earlier than actually having the disease. Uh, secondly, you can have symptoms. So uh, you could have stomach aches or headaches or uh, sore muscles. And uh, these are symptoms which are only apparent to you. So you go through them and that's how, that's how when you go to the doctor, you tell them what your symptoms are and then they can gauge the situation accordingly uh, about your infection. And sometimes it's both. So you have, if you have a rash on your skin, this is a sign of an infection, but also it's a symptom of that infection. Now, um, to carefully understand um, uh, sort of uh, infection because of viruses, we want, it's important to understand the incubation period because this is uh, the time or the initial period where viruses are replicating inside you. And what's interesting is every virus is different in that sense. So uh, as we've uh, seen recently, uh, the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 virus actually is uh, transmitted during the uh, incubation period. So uh, uh, scientists have gathered that the incubation period is roughly from one to two weeks as you've uh, seen. And uh, during this time, the virus is able to transmit. Uh, there are other cases, for example, Ebola. Ebola is not transmitted during the incubation period, but happens once you get the disease, which is after the point, right? And you have uh, earlier cases, for example, with SARS-CoV-1, where the virus is only transmitted when at the peak of the disease. So at the incubation time, you don't know. Now, there, there are some advantages and disadvantages. So the advantage is if it doesn't spread to the incubation period, it's great because once you develop symptoms and you know it, you can go to the doctor and get help. But for example, unfortunately, in cases of SARS-CoV-2, where the virus uh, transmits or sheds uh, itself uh, during incubation period, it's hard for the infected host to get help or to know that they are actually transmitting these viruses. So it becomes important. So I want to go through uh, just briefly uh, different viruses and the incubation period. So for example, you can see flu is about one to two days. So if you've had a family member who has a coworker, for example, who has flu, there's a good chance that uh, within a day or two, the rest of you at home will also develop flu-like symptoms. If you don't, of course, have uh, an immune system to fight it off, but uh, the incubation period is very low. Uh, for example, you can look at other viruses like rabies, for example. So if you've been out for a hike or something and you get scratched or bit by a dog, uh, 
or an animal with rabies, you have actually some time before you can get uh, to the nearest hospital to the doctor to get a vaccine. So here, and so with that, I, with that, I sort of say why uh, viruses are different in every case, and they have different incubation periods. And this incubation period kind of plays with how viruses get transmitted, which I will, of course, show in the next slides. So this is a very nice graphic, which kind of puts uh, the pandemics that we've had in the past into a perspective based on the death toll and how deadly they were. So here is the Black Death or the bubonic plague, right? It almost uh, wiped out close to 50% of Europe's population. And this was a terrible uh, uh, disaster in human history. And uh, of course, um, you know, we were at a time where we didn't have advanced medicine and we couldn't do anything about it. And a lot of people, unfortunately, fell victim to this virus. And then you have a situation uh, after that with smallpox. So the smallpox virus kill, um, is estimated to have killed 90% of Native Americans, right? And in the 1800s, it was killing 400,000 people annually. It was a terrible and a deadly virus. Now, uh, what happened and what's great is that during this time, Edward Jenner found a way uh, to uh, vaccinate against these viruses, which I'll talk about uh, later. And uh, that, that sort of started an advent towards uh, creating vaccines or, or actually finding uh, a, a sort of, let me put it, cure to fight these viruses, right? Um, and of course, now here you have uh, way down below is COVID-19. Uh, this is the latest um, September 29th estimate about 1 million deaths and counting. Um, so uh, it's sort of, uh, it, it's a nice way of looking at um, what we've dealt through from the past and what we are currently facing and put uh, sort of its deadliness into a perspective, right? So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some terms which are widely misunderstood and misrepresented. So let's take a very simple case. So you have uh, a population, right? So each icon is 10,000 people. So you have 20, so 200,000 people. That's one, let's say, county population. Now, let's say five uh, of these icons are infected, which means 50,000 people are infected with a virus. So when someone says, for example, on TV, you're showing that the incidence is 25%, that's what it means, that 50,000 people out of a 200,000 population have been infected with the virus. Now, uh, what is morbidity? Uh, now, from the people who are infected, the people who actually sh show signs and symptoms. So in this case, let's say 20,000 of the people show some signs and symptoms of the virus, then I would say the morbidity is actually 20%, which is 20,000 people divided by, in this case, let's say if the entire population is at risk, then it's 200,000, so it gives me 10%. Now, what is the mortality rate? Imagine out of those 20,000 people who had signs and symptoms, 10,000 people unfortunately were killed by the virus. And so the mortality rate would be uh, 10,000 over the entire population still at risk. So that gives me up to a 5% mortality. Now, uh, another interesting number and sort of a, sort of a crucial number in understanding uh, uh, endemics or pandemics in this case is the case fatality rate. Now, what does that tell me? So that tells that, uh, me that this is a ratio of the number of deaths caused by the virus to the number of people that have been infected. So this number is a more direct representation of uh, how deadly a virus can be. So in this case, for example, you have 50,000 people who were infected and 10,000 were killed because of the virus. And so you have a case fatality ratio of 20%, which is actually quite high, right? And this way, um, with these numbers, it's sort of easy to understand how deadly or how not deadly a virus can be. So I want to just uh, go through what I personally use as a reference to just check the numbers from time to time. Is I go to the Johns Hopkins Corona Virus Tracker. It's a very nice uh, website uh, where the University of Medicine in, under Johns Hopkins have actually created a uh, a GUI where you can actually check, for example, these are the global cases. It's updated daily. Uh, I think I picked this up two days ago. So you have uh, here the global deaths 
the number of people who have been recovered. You can go into the US map and for example, go to the state that you live in. For example, I would go to let's say Wisconsin and then I can go to a particular county. So for example, let's say I go to Milwaukee County and then this, uh, and then the window would zoom in to Milwaukee County and I would get an estimate of how many uh, of the previous numbers. So for example, you have 500 deaths to a confirmed cases of 36,000. So with these numbers, it's pretty easy to calculate, for example, the case fatality ratio, which basically tells you how deadly a virus is. So in this case, if you divide the number of deaths 500 by 36,000, you actually end up getting a close to 1.5% case fatality ratio. So that shows, so for example, you can, if you open uh, the other tab, you can see the county fatality rate is about 1.4%. So I, I think this is a very nice resource that everybody can use. You can you know, check it out on your phone. Uh, and um, it tells you also number of ICU beds and so on, or, or actually even defines what a fatality rate is. And it's very informative and I definitely recommend um, checking it out. So one of the other interesting numbers which scientists use to quantify an endemic um, is abasive reproductive number. Now you can think of it this way. For example, you go to a cafe. Now there are 20 people inside that cafe. Imagine you are infected with a virus, right? Now the basic reproductive number would tell me what's the probability that I'll infect, let's say another person, two more people, three more people and so on. So what does it depend on? Now it depends on the probability of infection given contact. What does that mean? That means that is the virus transmitted? Um, is it airborne? Is it sexually transmitted? That number goes here. Now that uh, multiplied by the average duration of contact. So when you're at the cashier, you're paying them, you, you will spend some time talking to them and that duration sort of goes here between the infected and the uninfected host. What else does it depend on? It depends on the duration of infection. So for how long have you been uh, having the virus, whether it's replicating and like we talked about earlier, the incubation period and does it transmit during that time. Now, why is this useful, right? This sort of tells me how bad a virus endemic can be or whether it's an endemic or not in the first place. So imagine R0, this value is less than one. I can say with certainty that there is no endemic and here's why. This number tells me that this total quantity, this product is less than one. What that means that the probability of infection, which usually since it's a probability can be either zero or one or in between is very low. So uh, I, there's a chance that I don't transmit the virus to somebody else and then that person doesn't spread it to someone else. So I don't have a chain of transmission. So I can say with some certainty that there would be no epidemic. Now, what happens when R0 is close to one? Now an epidemic might be possible because if the probability that when I meet my friend and he gets the virus from me is one, that means every time I meet him and he meets somebody else and so on and so forth, they keep the probability that they transmit the virus is high and that might start an epidemic. What if R0 is much greater than one? Definitely have an epidemic. And what happens is, just to give you an example, the COVID-19, they found that the median value of this R0 is 5.7. What does that mean? If I go to a bar, let's say, or if I go to some cafe, and if there are six people, then with absolute certainty, you could say that this infected host can uh, transmit the virus to these six people. And you see why uh, we have public health initiatives in place, for example, wearing a mask. So now, what affects these numbers is if the virus is airborne, which in the case of our current pandemic, the coronavirus is. So what you can do to sort of reduce this number so that it's no longer an epidemic is change the average duration, right? So that's why countries go into lockdowns. So they can reduce the average duration of contact to basically nothing. And then when you have a product and if it's multiplied by zero, then it's very low or it's zero, right? And so that way you can somehow uh, curb a spread of a virus. Now, this is a very nice graph 
So this shows uh, the case fatality ratio that I was talking about, which is proportional directly to the deaths, the number of deaths per infection. So uh, on the uh, vertical axis, you have case fatality, which means how deadly a virus can get. And on the horizontal axis, you have R0 values, which I just explained shows how easily a virus can spread. So you have measles, for example, which R0 of 15. That means if you're in a room or in a lecture hall and you have measles, there's a good chance 15 people can get that uh, uh, virus particle from you if they're not careful, right? But uh, at the same time, if you look at the case fatality ratio, it's not as high as other deadly viruses, for example, smallpox or Ebola or MERS. But let's say, thankfully, there are not values are less or not significantly high as measles. And so uh, changing the different terms that we've seen in R0 can help sort of uh, slow down an epidemic. Now, uh, we've talked about infection. So let's jump straight into what happens when you get a disease because of that infection. So pathogenesis is a, is a term uh, that is used to, uh, uh, is used to uh, uh, define a process which produces a, uh, produces a disease. So in our case, when we talk about viruses, we talk about viral pathogenesis. So, and every time uh, the, you get a disease because of a virus, it's always two components. Uh, there's the component, which is the virus that's replicating inside of you. So it's killing your cells, it's causing an infection. But at the same time, you have your immune system, which is fighting back. So it's also making you sick in some sense. It's giving you fever and so on. So there's a uh, there's a, a two-way attack in, in, in your system. And this is always how a viral disease uh, sort of occurs in, in, in humans, for example. So uh, there are three uh, requirements for a successful infection. Enough virus particles. So for example, if you have some particles of a virus, unfortunately on some surface that you touch. Now, if there's not enough of these particles, um, there's a good chance you won't get infected by them because either you uh, don't touch your face after you've touched these particles or they're not, uh, and, or you have good immunity. So nothing really happens to you, right? You, you're able to fight off these viruses. Now let's imagine a, a case where uh, you have enough particles now in your system. Now, if you have cells, which you've seen previously, the different types, which are accessible, susceptible, and permissive to these virus particles, um, then you have a chance that these viruses can go further into your system and then start replicating into uh, in live cells, which are usually vulnerable. And so that is also another reason for a successful infection. And then also, of course, um, usually in cases where that happens, you have your immunity, which fights it back. You have a defense system, but in some cases locally or uh, or otherwise, you have uh, these, uh, these immune systems generally which don't work. Or in cases like HIV, for example, they're completely overcome. And so in those cases, a, vi a viral sex, uh, infection is said to be successful. Now here is um, sites of entry into a human host. So you can see, uh, for example, uh, we have um, quite luckily a limited uh, 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 sites of uh, entry a virus can take. So you have your eyes, you, so you, the eyes have a membrane with lined with live cells. So you can get uh, affected by viruses there. You have the mouth and the nose, you have the anus. And once it passes through any of these uh, sites of entry, then it can get into the respiratory, respiratory tract. So for example, influenza viruses, they can really cause you harm if they enter the respiratory tract. But however, uh, if they enter through your mouth and just go into the, let's say, alimentary tract, then nothing happens because these influenza viruses are not active and they get deactivated and you can pass them out as fecal matter. Um, one of the other important ports of entry is the skin. Now the skin is the largest organ in the body. Now, uh, I want to sort of, uh, in that context, look at how mosquitoes spread viruses because they usually, 
um, bite you and and passes through the skin so um, so what is important is to look at uh, female mosquitoes because female mosquitoes are the ones that need blood so they uh, need blood to usually lay eggs and because um, we have ports of entry which is our skin there's a good chance that they can use their proboscis uh, it's sort of a straw and they can um, uh, sort of enter into the epidermis into the dermis where it can find blood vessels where it can uh, find blood to lay eggs now uh, but uh, it's interesting because uh, if you look at the epidermis and the stratum corneum these are usually dead skin cells they are the ones which usually end up as dust on your furniture for example so we are constantly shedding these dead skin cells and so for example if virus particles actually fall on these cells they don't do anything to you because these cells are all dead but unfortunately in the case of mosquitoes when uh, a female mosquito uh, probes into a human skin using the proboscis uh, it can uh, spew out particles into your dermis which is more vulnerable than the epidermis for example here you have uh, the blood vessels where now if for example if you think a mosquito um, has already uh, bitten an uh, infected host it can now um, allow these virus particles to get into your blood vessels directly now fair warning uh, there's uh, some graphic sort of a video of how a proboscis from a female mosquito injects into a um, uh, into a skin of a mouse um, and so you can check that out. So as you can see, uh, the, the, uh, the mosquito constantly uh, uh, probes, the, uh, probes the proboscis into, uh, into the, uh, the skin or into the dermis to be exact to find this, this capillary, this blood vessels. And so while it does that, it injects out its saliva into uh, the dermis. So the saliva of the mosquito is interesting because it has some anticoagulant and some kind of anesthetic properties. So when a mosquito bites you, for example, um, you don't realize it at first. So um, if, it in, if it bites an infected host a prior, uh, when it looks for uh, uh, blood vessels in your dermis, for example, it can spew out these particles as part of the saliva into your dermis which makes you vulnerable at this point so you so that's how uh, mosquitoes spread viruses for example so uh, now that we've looked at um, how uh, a virus can sort of cause infection and diseases we look at how once you have an infected host um, how these diseases are diseases are transmitted um, you have horizontal transmission, which is uh, shown here nicely between sheep, for example. So it's members of the same species. If you have different species, which is zoonotic, that, uh, for example, the COVID-19 was, it came from bats or pangolin. So it jumped between species. And so you would call that a zoonotic transmission. Uh, then you have iatrogenic, which is, for example, when healthcare workers um, don't take enough care or protection uh, to disinfect themselves and they might cause infection in uh, patients uh, with, uh, with a lower immune function. Then you have nosocomial, which is basically when you go to a hospital because you have a sprain and you end up uh, picking uh, a pathogen there uh, just because you've touched an infected surface. Then you have vertical transmission uh, as was explained in the previous uh, talk, where uh, uh, viruses are passed from the mother to the offspring. This happens in cases of DNA viruses, for example. And then you have germline transmission, where the cells in the agent, are they already have part of the virus in its DNA, in its RNA, and this is transmitted as part of the genome um, into their offsprings, for example. So in the first four cases, transmission happens through virus particles. And in the fifth one, which is germline, happens through the genome. So I want to talk about virus shedding. 
it's an important part of uh, virus transmission. So you can see uh, in the figure up here. So when we talk or cough uh, or sneeze, uh, we usually let out mucus droplets, which are uh, encroached with a lot of uh, biological molecules. And especially if you're an infected host, these also contain bacteria or viruses. Now, uh, what happens? These particles or aerosols, they travel distances based on the size of these droplets. So because of, uh, in, uh, in case of the recent uh, COVID pandemic, uh, researchers noted that these droplets don't travel further than six feet, for example, on average. So this is why, you know, we've enforced a six feet rule. Uh, but what happens in many cases is if you have a dry environment, these mucus droplets uh, tend to evaporate and the, the contents become smaller and smaller. And if they become smaller, they tend to travel larger distances. They don't fall off easily. And so uh, that's one way to know, for example, how a virus transmits and then you can go back to, for example, the R0 value and the probability changes there. For example, if an airborne virus, uh, this is true, that it would travel to a larger distances compared to some other viruses which are sexually transmitted, for example. Um, another way is, of course, nasal secretions. So you could, for example, blow your nose and not wash your hands, which you should never do. Um, uh, uh, and then what happens is, for example, if you touch common surfaces, uh, you can have enough virus particles sitting there. And uh, what's interesting is, uh, since nasal secretions have mucus on them, they kind of act like a nice biofilm, which actually protects these viruses. Uh, and, um, uh, and then they stay on for that surface for a much longer time. For example, in tissues, if you've discarded tissues and uh, someone ends up touching these tissues, there might be enough virus particles to infect this person. Or for example, when you're taking the bus or a subway, if you touch the poles and if they have uh, virus particles on them, there's a good, and if you touch your face after that, of course, uh, uh, there's a good chance that you can get infected by these viruses. So where it's a very important when you take public transport and so on that you uh, not touch your nose or your face after that and go home and wash your face uh, with soap and detergent. The reason why I say with soap is because of the mucus, uh, having this biofilm usually protects these particles. So it's very important to use soap, which breaks into these lipids, and you can uh, make sure that you that the virus particles are completely washed off. Um, so yeah, um, learn how to sneeze politely. Another way to sort of look at uh, uh, you know, infectious diseases and ep epidemics uh, was uh, an interesting thing what they did with World of Warcraft. This was, I guess, 2005. So what the creators of Warcraft did and the developers was they invented this character called Hakar down here. Now, uh, what happened was the players who challenged uh, this warlord and killed him, uh, Hakar used to spew out infected blood uh, onto these players, right? And since uh, World of Warcraft is a virtual world where you can travel uh, to virtual cities and so on, these players travel to these virtual cities and you can see here and carry the virus with them. So here you have a scenario in a public place where you can see the, some of the players who are infected and uh, the players who actually died and they've uh, uh, demarcated them as skeletons over here. So that was one way how they used video games to sort of model how, um, how an epidemic can come about. Also another interesting game, uh, if people have played it, is the Plague Inc, uh, which is actually now available in board game, I didn't know. So, it, uh, so you can play it on your phone. Uh, it's interesting because it starts off with uh, you as the you know, uh, uh, designer of a pandemic. You would start by taking a patient zero and placing him a, in a country of your choice. And then uh, as the game proceeds, you increase the severity of the virus. So uh, depending on some points that you collect, you can mutate the virus, you can cause it to be airborne. And, and it's sort of a nice illustration of how um, as the virus evolves, it uh, spreads between different countries. And um, well, unfortunately, the motive of this game is to sort of uh, infect the world and kill everybody in it. And that's how you win the game which I personally think is a bit dark, but yeah. So 
our best case scenario against all these terrible things, vaccines, right? If you look at the life ex expectancy um, over the years between men and women, um, you can see it's increased all the way from close to 50 to now 80 years, which is great. And this can be mostly attributed to, of course, uh, advances in medicine, public health initiatives, and of course, vaccines. For example, if you notice the dip here at 1918, this was the influenza epidemic, which killed a lot of people, right? And scientists uh, similarly expect another dip here now because of the current pandemic in 2020. Now, what do vaccines really do, right? So vaccines are, you can think of them as sort of trained first responders. They tell the immune system to prepare for a virus. So when there's a virus particle that enters through you, for example, through a mosquito, uh, or you've eaten something which has uh, a virus which activates in your stomach, it sort of mobilizes the whole system. Your whole immune system is mobilized to fight against it. Uh, what else does this do? Because if you, if you have people who are vaccinated, it breaks a chain of transmission. So you can indirectly affect uh, the value which we discussed of R0. And because of this, you can even avoid an epidemic from occurring in the first place. So I want to go through roughly uh, a timeline um, of vaccine development. So it started with Edward Jenner uh, creating the first smallpox vaccine. So what did he do? So he noticed that uh, women who milk cows um, didn't get affected by uh, smallpox, which at the time was killing a lot of people in Europe. So he decided to take pustules from these milkmaids and he infected a little boy with it. Now this boy developed uh, uh, cowpox, which uh, affected these women. Um, and then uh, he developed some symptoms. And after two weeks, he injected smallpox from a patient suffering from smallpox into this little boy. And this little boy uh, didn't develop symptoms of smallpox, but actually was able to fight the smallpox infection. And so many, uh, and he of course published this, and many other countries uh, took up uh, this way of uh, producing the first vaccination scheme. Um, and then over the years, for example, Louis Pasteur uh, developed a vaccine for rabies. Um, and, and, and so on between years, you had uh, other people uh, slowly develop vaccines. Now, we have to remember that at this time, uh, people did not know uh, of virus as particles. They just knew that there was a substance which made you sick, um, whether airborne or not. And it was very hard for them to sort of specialize or make um, vaccines effective enough that it worked. But we must appreciate uh, uh, their endeavor in this without, not, without, of course, having the full knowledge of viruses and how they work, like we have now, for example. Now, uh, one of uh, the important strides in healthcare, and I think in, uh, which, is, uh, which is the eradication of smallpox in 1979, now, this is an amazing feat of human society. We were able to take a deadly virus which killed about 60 million people, right? And we were able to completely eradicate it from the face of the earth. Now, you have some labs, a few labs in the world, which actually have some smallpox, wax, uh, some smallpox particles with them. This is, of course, in cases where you might have a bioterrorism attack, for example, and these are kept on standby if ever there's a need to produce um, vaccines. But um, other than the grim note, uh, it's, it's amazing that we've reached a point in the 70s where we could uh, completely eradicate a disease. Uh, of course, um, much later after that, we've seen that polio was also eliminated from the Western Hemisphere, another important achievement. And then you have in 2000 where endemic measles was eliminated from the United States. Uh, and so this sort of shows the importance of vaccine in, in fighting against viruses and breaking the chain of transmission. Uh, so you have a very uh, funny painting here. So this was done during the time of Edward Jenner. So as I mentioned, uh, Edward Jenner used cowpox particles to inject into humans uh, to help them against smallpox. Uh, and the, um, the anti-vaxxers at the time, you would say, uh, 
uh, made uh, made fun of him and claimed that you would start developing parts of a cow if you were infected by cowpox. So now uh, I found this very interesting video which came up uh, two weeks ago on Nature, uh, which shows uh, what happens when um, uh, you're given a vaccine and how it sort of mobilizes your immune system and helps it respond, for example, in case where you have a virus attack you again into the future. So let's just take a look. Vaccines have an important role in protecting us from infectious disease. But how do they work? But simply, vaccines train our immune system to detect and attack pathogens. And we're going to walk you through how they do it from start to finish. Our immune system is a marvelously complex network of molecules and cells, which has the power to destroy pathogens like viruses and bacteria. The part of the immune system that vaccines train is called the adaptive immune system. Its first job is to recognize an invader. In the case of this bacterium, it does this by detecting molecular markers called antigens that are part of all pathogens. After detecting an antigen, the adaptive part of the immune system starts mounting a bespoke response. B cells convert to plasma cells and start creating proteins called antibodies, which bind specifically to the antigen. Together with immune cells called phagocytes, antibodies can destroy the pathogen. The adaptive immune system also produces killer T cells, which have the ability to detect and destroy cells infected with the pathogen. But it doesn't end there. To prevent against future infections, the adaptive immune system also has a memory. It produces long-lived memory cells, which lie in wait, ready to pump out the right antibodies and killer T cells if the same pathogen is ever seen again. This is called immunity. Vaccines work by activating the adaptive immune system and so creating immunity. They safely introduce antigens for the immune system to train on, preparing itself to fight real infections in the future. So what actually goes into a vaccine? Well, there are several different types. One of the most common are called live attenuated vaccines. These include things like MMR or BCG. Live attenuated vaccines work by introducing a weakened version of a living pathogen into the body. These attenuated pathogens are not strong enough to cause disease in people with healthy immune systems, but they can still trigger a strong immune response. Live attenuated vaccines trigger a similar immune response to a real infection, leaving behind the same memory cells. This means that some can provide a lifetime of protection after just one or two doses. Another key type of vaccine is called a subunit or recombinant vaccine. They work differently. Instead of a live sample, subunit vaccines contain only part of the pathogen. For instance, the vaccine for human papillomavirus, HPV, uses hollow virus-like particles made from a protein found in HPV. Alone, these subunits cannot get the immune system's attention, and so they need a bit of help from another ingredient, an adjuvant. Adjuvants wake up the immune system, triggering it to see the subunit antigens and start creating antibodies and memory cells. Subunit vaccines contain no live pathogens and so lack the genetic information needed to replicate. That means they are not infectious and are safe even for people with weakened immune systems. Great, but generally, they don't trigger the production of as many memory cells compared to live attenuated vaccines. And so they don't provide such long lasting protection. Training the immune system through vaccination helps to protect individuals from infection. But vaccines can also protect people who can't receive them. This is called herd protection or herd immunity. Herd immunity is created when a large percentage of a population is immune to a disease. It works by disrupting chains of infection. Without new hosts to infect, pathogens can't survive. That means that if a pathogen tries to infect someone who is vaccinated and so immune, it dies and the chain of infection is broken. If enough chains are broken in a population, 
it becomes very difficult for pathogens to reach those who would be vulnerable. Herd immunity protects millions of people around the world. But if vaccination rates drop, there is a risk that diseases can reappear. For example, measles was declared eradicated in the United States in 2000. But since then, falling vaccination rates have led to a resurgence of the disease with outbreaks recorded in 31 states. If herd immunity is maintained for long enough, though, diseases can be eradicated completely. For example, smallpox, which is estimated to have killed 300 million people in the 20th century, is now considered extinct. All thanks to vaccination, its training regime, and the wonders of herd immunity. I think that was a pretty uh, a summed up talk about um, how vaccines work in you and how, why it's really important that everybody gets vaccinated, especially against deadly viruses, which can cause, uh, you know, uh, lasting uh, deformations or, or irreversible changes, and so, or even worse, death. So with that, I want to sort of conclude uh, an important thing. Um, vaccines are sort of part of us. They're here now, and it's very important that we sort of look at them from a perspective of fighting a virus, right? Viruses are basically molecules uh, and chemicals, if you think about it, and they don't uh, live or they don't have an agenda. So uh, we should refrain ourselves from uh, politicizing or anthropomorphizing uh, viruses and um, thinking of them as they're going to attack you or you. No, it's not like that. Viruses are just particles which, you know, unluckily end up on your surface because of contact. And so uh, it's very important uh, to uh, take vaccines because if you think about it, because of this uh, vaccines and of course further immunization, many childhood diseases which used to um, uh, kill a lot of people back in the old day are no longer here with us at the moment. And because of that, it's a sort of a forefront of the public health initiatives in the Western world, at least. And slowly, I think they're progressing into developing nations so that we can have um, no cases where a further epidemic is possible in the future, right? And so this is sort of a current tracker. So this was updated about two, three days ago about uh, developments in the vaccine. It's a very nice article, which sort of shows the different phases um, in which the vaccines are present at the moment, but unfortunately, none of them are approved. Um, and, you know, these, these processes, of course, take a long time because you have to be very careful and you can never miss any of these phases. They have to make sure it passes through all these phases and uh, the proper clinical researchers uh, sign and uh, approve the next stage, of course. Uh, and uh, so I want to end, and here I want to sort of... Uh, uh, sort of give a shout out to Vincent uh, Racaniello. So uh, Professor Racaniello has this amazing YouTube channel called Microbe TV, where he talks about viruses, which are his primary uh, research interest. He is an experienced virologist, and he has a lot of uh, nice podcasts like This Week in Virology, Virology Watch, for example, which I've watched and I've actually watched a couple of his lectures in the past. And I would definitely recommend uh, if you have the time to check them out. If you're really interested in viruses, this is a great resource to get started. And then, of course, there are other links uh, to the Coronavirus Tracker, the World Health Organization, and the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to conclude. And I hope um, you've used this uh, talk um, to sort of further increase your curiosity in viruses. I, I am not a virologist myself, I'm a theoretical physicist, uh, but I'm really interested in how these pathogens work and how it spreads and how we can, as individuals, understand how we can mitigate them uh, by ourselves, by being careful and by taking vaccines. So yeah, thank you. Next time, make sure to join us for a talk about exotic telescopes on November 21st, same time, not necessarily the same place since it will be virtual, but that's up to your discretion. See you then.